All right, good evening. Um, this is a meeting of the City of Montpelier Development Review Board. The date is Tuesday, February 18th, 2020. My name is Kate McCarthy. I'm the vice chair of this board, um, acting as chair this evening. Um, and the other members here from my right are... Rob Goodwin. I'm Michael Lazorchak. Meredith Crandall, staff. Clay Rock. Ryan Kane. Roger Kranz. Very good, thank you. Um, so the next item on our agenda is the approval of the agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda or any modifications to it? I'll actually move to modify uh, item three on the agenda to say elect chair and vice chair as necessary. Okay. Is that acceptable to others? Absolutely. Okay. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as amended? So moved. Should I, I'm, I'm moving. You move the first one. <laughs> no, okay. Well, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry about that. Somebody else. <laughs> All right. I move, I move to approve the agenda as printed. Great. As, so, as, as, as modified? As modified. As modified. <laughs> yes. <laughs> on it. I'll second that. Great. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please signify by raising your right hand. All right, we have approved the agenda. Thank you all for your help <laughs> with that. Um, all right, that brings us to item three on the agenda, which is to elect a chair. And I will, by way of explanation, share that our previous chair, Dan Richardson, was appointed to the remainder of a city council seat. And so um, once he was appointed, once that was effective, he stepped down, resigned immediately um, his chairship of the DRB. Um, so we need to elect a new chair. Um, so are there any nominations for chair? I'll nominate our able and uh, very talented vice chair, Kay McCarthy, to serve as chair. Thank you. Is there a second? Second that motion. Um, motion by Ryan, second by Roger. Um, all those in favor, please signify by raising your right hand. Rob, Michael, Roger, Ryan, and Claire. Um, opposed? Abstaining. I will abstain. And I will thank you all um, for, for, that, for that motion and election. I, I greatly appreciate it. Um, so now we need a vice chair, musical chairs, as, okay. the, as the case may be. Um, do we have a motion for vice chair? A nominee for vice chair. And just as a note, you can nominate people in absentia. Do we have any information on whether people in absentia uh, have any interest or willingness to serve as the vice chair? He does. <laughs> they do. <laughs> that has been that information has been delivered. Yes. Um, Kevin has expressed a willingness to serve as vice chair. If yep. and uh, other people are and others, it, it can uh, be can express interest as well. I would nominate uh, Kevin O'Connell to be, be the uh, vice chair. Uh, <laughs> you know, he's very diligent, pays good attention. Always is right next to me, so sad to see him go over there. But uh, he'd be a good candidate for the job. Well, you can move over here, too. You can take my seat. Yeah. Yeah. We have a motion. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay, we've had a motion and a second to nominate um, Kevin as vice chair. All those in favor, please signify by raising your right hand. The motion passes unanimously. Um, thank you. Just a note, these are to fill out the remainder of the terms. The seats will it'll have to be newly elected come August at the annual election time. Yes, thank you. That's a good clarification. So this is to fill the remainder of the of the existing terms. Thank you. All right. So um, comments from the chair. That's me. Um, <laughs> that's the first comment. <laughs> Thank you all uh, for your votes. I've uh, been an alternate and a vice chair, a regular member and a vice chair, and it will be a great experience to continue to serve with you all as chair. Um, I am sad to see Dan go because he was also great to serve with as a chair, um, but wish him the best in his in his city council endeavors. Um, I also want to welcome Roger back to the board after. Thank you, Kate. It's really great to have you. Thank you for stepping up to be a part of this. All right. I'd like to move on to agenda item five, 
um, approving the meeting minutes from January 21st of 2020. Um, is there a motion to approve those meeting minutes? Uh, I will move to approve the minutes as printed. We have a motion from Ryan. Is there a second? I'll second that motion. Motion from Ryan, second from Rob. All those in favor who are eligible to vote, which includes myself, Ryan, Rob, and Michael. Um, signify your approval. All in favor of approving the minutes as printed, uh, raise your right hand. Okay, the motion passes. Uh, Kate, Ryan, Rob, and Michael. Thank you. We have approved the minutes of our last meeting. All right, so that brings us to our, um, our, the, our only application that we have on our agenda for today. So if you'd like to come and have a seat at this table in front of this microphone, um, I'll ex explain the process and then swear you in to give testimony on, on this matter. So this is uh, 159 State Street, um, Court Street Associates, and what we're reviewing and potentially providing approval for is the demolition of a derelict historic shed at the rear of the property. So just to kind of lay out how this goes from here, we're gonna hear an overview of the project from Meredith, and then we'll turn it over to you to talk a little bit about the project and, and the um, how it meets the criteria. Um, then we'll have questions for you. Um, it looks like there aren't any folks here to be heard to weigh in on this one way or another. So unless people pop in for public comment, um, the conversation will continue between you and us. Um, our goal is to understand the project and make sure we understand all the facts so we can know that it meets the zoning bylaw. Um, so we'll start by swearing you in. So if you wouldn't mind raising your right hand, please. Um, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? Yes. Thank you. So, um, and, and would, you, would you let us know your name as well, sir? Yana Walter. Yana Walter, thank you. All right, so I'll turn it over to Meredith for an overview of the, of the application. Uh, okay, so 159 State Street, um, the, this project doesn't involve the main building on the property, which is also the main building in the historical, the National Register of Historic Places listing. Um, it involves a small, well, maybe not too small, but an outbuilding at the rear of the property um, that is also mentioned um, and listed on the National Register. Um, and so that is why demolition of that building needs to come before the DRB. Um, if it weren't on the National Register, it wouldn't be here. Um, the Design Review Committee has reviewed this because it is also in the Design Review Control District. Um, and the um, Design Review Committee approved the demolition. They didn't have any issues with it, um, especially because with the roof caved in and at least one of the walls already down, um, there was a sense that it, 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 there was really no way to, to save the structure at this point. Um, so that's, you know, if there, there's, you still need to go through all the demolition criteria um, that are in, sorry, uh, section 3004. Um, and this is outlined in on pages four through six of the staff report. Those are the main issues before you at this point. Um, so that's what I've got, unless anybody has any specific questions for me before we move on. Any questions for Meredith? Okay. Yeah. According to the staff report, the standards for demolition are the big ones that we're going to look at. And we also, looks like there may be a couple of fairly simple questions, potentially simple questions about how the site will be, then be restored and regraded what, if any, landscaping there will be. Um, really just those two things as they pertain to our bylaws. So we'll, we'll get to those in the conversation. Uh, great, so I'll turn it over to you, Jana, if you'd like to talk a little about the project. I, I don't know what else to say. It's, it's, <laughs> it's okay. easy, it's a very small structure. Um, we're hoping to take it apart and grade and seed the site. It's about a 20 by 20 okay. shed. Oh, um, I have. Um, I did have Robert McCullough, who's a historic preservation um, professional, uh, look at it and give his opinion of of the 
uh, structure, and he wrote me a short email uh, sort of outlining some of the same things, uh, confirming that the building has failed structurally and uh, documenting a little bit of um, history that he um, knows about it. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I would just note, note that within this, um, Mr. McCullough's assessment is that theoretically it might be possible to reconstruct this building, but it would be a new building and not a historic one. He would recommend photo documentation as appropriate mitigation for its loss. And then he notes you need to obtain a permit, which you're here doing tonight. Okay, great. Um, so I think what we should we, what we should do next is dive right into the criteria for demolition of a historic structure and talk through um, how those how those standards are met. So in the staff report, um, that discussion begins on page four. Um, and in section 3004D, demolition, one of the first things we need to know about is that there is a demolition and site restoration plan. So you did mention in your application and just now um, that you plan to demolish. And c could you tell us a little bit about your plan to demolish and what to do with the site after? So I defer to professionals. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a contracting company. And it's, I think it's a simple wooden structure with a chimney. There's not much... Um, uh, you know, I think just the wooden structure will be taken apart as well as the chimney and they will um, dispose of uh, the materials and then grade the site and seed it, which is, um, it mentions something about it being on the slopes. It's actually on a flat lawn. Okay. Yeah, no, it's, it's depending on our, the way our maps work mm -hmm. out. Sometimes the slopes um, are... The, s the slopes data gets skewed because of trees or even just the roof of the yeah. building. Okay. So, so that is helpful because one of the points Meredith had raised for us has to do with its location on a steep slope, and your testimony asserts that it's on a flat surface, and yep. so that part of the bylaw does, is, is met. Great. Thank you. All right. And you've confirmed that there is a demolition and site restoration plan. Um, so now I think what we should do is, is talk through, and I, I, I may ask for Meredith's help with this one a little bit, but talk through these standards for the demolition of a historic structure. So um, we, we need to find, it, it is our job to, to approve this, to find that the rehabilitation of the structure or a portion of the structure would cause undue financial hardship to the owner or the demolition is part of a site development plan and design plan that would provide clear and substantial benefit to the community. So those are the two paths we can take. We're gonna probably do the analysis under the first, which is that to prove that rehabilitation, uh, hear your testimony about why rehabilitation of the structure or portion in thereof would cause undue financial hardship. Okay, so um, what, what, we're, what we need to understand is whether the building cannot be feasibly used or rented at a reasonable rate of return in its present condition, or if, rehabilit or if rehabilitated, and that the denial of the application would deprive all reasonable use. Do you want to jump in, Meredith? That'd be fine with me. Yeah. So can maybe do this a little succinctly. Well, the the what I was what my problem with dealing with this particular fact scenario under this analysis is that yes, this is a commercial property. But that particular shed has never, if it has been rented, it was decades ago. Um, it's not something that can be rented now. Mm -hmm. If they can't, rebuilding it the size it's at doesn't make it economically feasible to then rent out given, I mean, the other, the rest of the utilities. I would ask. Yes. I mean, can, can right. it be? I, mean, I, I would put, yeah, I would yeah. put that to the, that question to the applicant. It, if it were to be rehabilitated, could you rent it out and make use of it and contribute to the economic value of your property? 
Um, so it would have to be rebuilt from the ground up, mm-hmm. which which is you know possible, but w- it, it wouldn't be non-conforming. So we would like to uh, take this existing building down and maybe rebuild something down the road that's further away from the boundary uh, property boundary and. Uh, you know, the current building doesn't have utilities, so it couldn't, even if we were to rehabilitate it, it couldn't be rented. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. No, I don't mind a bit. Thank you. Um, so I guess, I mean, it's, it is a, it is an, a difficult, maybe it's not a difficult structure to do under this analysis. It was one of the problems I was wrestling with, which is. Sure. Wait, sure. maybe the analysis here isn't as thorough as it could have been. That's okay. Uh, we do in, we do encounter a lot of outbuildings, especially um, carriage houses or garages that have fallen into disrepair. I think the a difference with this one is that it is a much smaller building mm-hmm. um, that was probably not previously rented for parking cars or store, storing things. So, um, yeah. Um, all right, so what I'll do is I'll just come, I'll just walk through these criteria for approving undue financial hardship, and then um, a- as I go, I would certainly encourage other board members to chime in with any comments or analysis as well. Um, so wh- when did you acquire this property? Uh, I became the property manager about four years ago. Property manager about four years yeah, ago. Yeah, and I think it was acquired in 2005. Okay. And do you know, if was there awareness of its historic nature in 2005? I, I don't know. Position. Hmm? I don't know. You don't know? Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and the next criterion is the structural soundness of the building or any structures on the property and their suitability for rehabilitation. And I've, I've heard you say it is not structurally sound. You provided the evidence from Mr. McCullough. Um, and it's not suitable for rehabilitation. Wouldn't get you far. Okay. Um, The next criterion has to do with economic feasibility of rehabilitation or reuse of the structure. Um, And you've also provided testimony that it would not be economical or or feasible. Um, Meredith, could you help guide me on the next criterion, which reads the current level of economic return on the property as considered in relation to eight listed factors? Um, So the other thing to to remember is you don't actually have to use all of these criteria okay. in the analysis. Mm-hmm. It's, um, you know, as these are all relevant. Mm-hmm. So that item. As relevant, okay. Yep, it's so the, i got to find my listed factors. Okay. It's, it's these, it's A to I. Yep, I yep. Oh, you got it. Well, yeah, but they aren't in here. So that would be the amount paid for the property, date of purchase and party from whom purchased, a whole bunch of information about the purchase of the property, Mm. Um, whether there's been a substantial decrease in the fair market value of the property, whether Mm -hmm. there would be a decrease in the fair market value of the property as Mm -hmm. a result of the denial of the permit. Mm fair market value of the property at the time the application is filed. It's it's all about looking at all these economic factors. Okay. Um, real estate taxes for the previous three years. This isn't this isn't information I asked from the applicant no. because it didn't seem to make sense in mm-hmm. this particular application. Okay. I, I agree with that okay. choice. Um, is that does that work for other board members as well that we would bypass that portion of the consideration. Okay. Um Similarly, the, another criterion is the feasibility of alternative uses that can earn a reasonable economic return from the property as considered in relation to detailed information from engineers. Um, I think we can, we can bypass that as well for similar reasons. Um, we are, the next criterion has to do with whether the applicant has demonstrated that they've looked into lots of other options like tax credits and grants and things. Um, we're talking, it sounds like, about a 400 square foot structure mm-hmm. that is a contributing structure but not terribly unique or... Um, well, it hasn't ever been used. It was just kind of in the back of the property. Mm-hmm. Um, is it visible from any like public vantage point? Not from the road, but if you're in a parking lot, I, you can see it. Okay. It looks like a small cabin. Yeah, but the, the parking lot on that property, yeah, right? The parking lot on the property. Okay. Yeah. But so from the 
Public Road from State Street, you can you can't really see it. No, it's way set back. Okay. All right. Um, okay. The the last item that we take under consideration is input from community organizations, preservation groups, other associations, and private citizens who may wish to evaluate and comment. And um, Bob McCullough has provided some information that we've received tonight. The Design Review Committee has recommended that this be approved for demolition. Um, is there other input that you've received or feedback that you've received about um, how this structure should be dealt with? Uh, nope, but I was uh, pleasantly surprised that the um, the committee, the previous hearing, they all went by and looked at it, so, which was nice. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> Good to have visitors. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the comments from the design review committee, um, I think, was a, a question mark as to whether anything was salvageable. Um, right. And have you thought about that? Uh, you know, most of the siding is rotten and the windows are broken. I mean, we could save the front door. That's pretty cute. <laughs> um, I think I think the hope is that we would be able to uh, potentially improve on the historic structure that's there in uh, you know in a couple of years and like t to add more to the property and maybe we could reuse that. Right. So the front. So are you are you amenable to um, kind of saving any? Features that are in fact salvageable, like if the front door is salvageable, yep. Yep. then you'll, you're amenable to holding yep. onto it. And I think the front door definitely. Yep. Okay. And what about the chimney? Is that it looks cool? You can take. I think it's uh, it's taking the structure with it. It's all yeah. the way down. <laughs> I guess that makes it less cool when it's pulling down the rest of the structure. <laughs> Takes the fun out of the chimney. It's in photo B. That big chimney, is that part of this structure? Yep. <clears throat> yes. Wow. Okay. Yeah, you can sort of see where the roof was. <laughs> ah, all right. <laughs> it's a big chimney. <sighs> so. I've walked through the criteria, but I invite other board members to ask other questions about the project in general or, or the criteria themselves and um, any other, other evidence you might like to have to be convinced that they are met. I think I'd just like to highlight one of the findings of uh, Robert McCullough. It says it's certainly, as you can see in the photo, it's lost its historical integrity and thus no longer historically significant. And uh, I think that uh, speaks volumes to what we're at and uh, what fact, you know, <laughs> how much more we really need to discuss this. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think it is, it's noted in here that, you know, one of the considerations is, you know, you can't. If you buy a historic building and then just let it fall into the ground mm -hmm. um, through your own neglect over many years, that you know that's that's a different situation, and that's something that we would strongly discourage by just saying, "Oh well, right. it fell over, so I guess you can demolish it." Mm -hmm. it. Seems like it's pretty clear that's not the case; that the current ownership is fairly recent. Um, so yeah, I'm a champion for this building. I can tell you that much. Yeah. <laughs> it's a beautiful building. <laughs> <laughs> We've done a lot. Yeah, that's great. So, Thank you, Ryan, for highlighting uh, that. Worth noting, but mm -hmm. I certainly agree that. I, th I think Robert McCullough, um, he, you know, he he seemed to think that the damage just dates back uh, quite a long time because it's been in the shade of the trees for a long time, right next to a uh, water. There's like a stream on the side. Yep. Okay. Any other questions from the board members? Well, the last um, item that was highlighted in the staff report pertains to landscaping, um, which is section 3203 of our zoning bylaw. Um, could, could you explain for us, Meredith, you, you highlighted the requirement for a landscaping plan mm -hmm. um, and the fact that this one was not provided, but we have receive testimony about how the site will be dealt with after the removal of the building and right. find that meets the standards. Yeah. So um, with the relatively recent f final adoption of the new landscaping provisions, um, all applications theoretically are supposed to have landscaping plans submitted. Um, we did get 
documentation of the current trees that are on site um, and just running calculations on those, it appears to me that there's more than enough um, natural landscaping on the site to meet the total landscaping requirements. And so it really didn't, doesn't make sense to ask for a formal landscaping plan at this point, especially considering we're dealing with changes to the back portion of the parcel. You're not looking at trying to have new screening. There, there's, no, there's nothing going on here. So it's just, it's just unfortunately, it's one of those things where because I couldn't officially check a box, mm -hmm. you, you're going to need to check that box for yourselves. Okay. Yeah, seeing as the landscaping plan would show uh, a grassed area where a building used to be, <laughs> I think we can all uh, substantially understand what, what that entails without the need for a, a, a written document. Perfect. <laughs> fellow board members amenable to that conclusion? Absolutely. Good. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. We've checked that box. Very good. Well, is there any other, uh, any further discussion uh, amongst board members or questions for the applicant? I had, a, I had a question, and maybe this is for Meredith. In the, in the staff report on page four, um, in the red, it, it notes, uh, recommends the board consider the DRC's expertise in making the final determination. And I was just curious, what was that in regard to um, the building materials being salvageable? Um, it was, so that was in regard to, in general, just that the design review committee approved the demolition. Um, and on the design review committee and at that particular hearing, we had two um, historic preservation uh, professionals. Mm. Um, but then in addition to that, also the, um, you know, idea that, you know, they've reviewed it, they've okayed it. You know, yes, consider their 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 notes about the preservation of some materials, if anything can be saved, um, like the door, as discussed. Um, and then, you know, there was I had I had seen, but I couldn't submit um, the email from Bob McCullough and his comment about making sure that there's some photo documentation of the building before it's demolished the rest of the way, um, and maybe having that submitted to. Um, the zoning administrator's office is something to just put in the file. I think would be you know there's some documentation here, but maybe more extensive photos before it's fully demolished. Is that a, amenable to the applicant mm -hmm. to do some more documentation? Yeah. Great, definitely. That'd be uh, so I, I, I have a, a question about um, salvaging of materials, mm -hmm. and maybe this is this is more kind of a, an administrative or um, enforceable. Mm -hmm. aspect of of it and and if that would be uh, kind of a, a, a finding or if that would be a condition um, it's kind of a hard one to enforce right um, <laughs> because you know being able to go out there and I don't have the expertise to say Before. yes that's salvageable that yes that no that's not mm -hmm. um, you know, I, a creative way to do it would be to, you know, maybe ask the applicant to have somebody go out and you know, have a professional go out and look at the materials, somebody other than just your standard contractor, but that's up to you, and it's how much burden you want to put on mm -hmm. the applicant. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it could be a finding that, there could be a finding in here that applicant has, has agreed, if you do, to salvage maybe some of the char key character defining features if if they're salvageable the architectural features such as the front door um, but that's not necessarily something that's very enforceable you know between especially between you know who knows what's these pictures were taken before we had lots of snow mm -hmm. you know who knows what condition it's going to be in after this winter's snow and, and ice and weight I don't know that it would be a condition per se, but the findings could include yeah. encouragement to salvage yeah. whenever possible for eventual reuse on the property, ideally for eventual reuse on the property, which yeah. you've expressed in, uh, some yeah. interest in. More so than a condition. Right, I was. Just, I just noted that in the, in the application, there was some information by the applicant 
uh, just saying that all the materials would be removed off site. So mm -hmm. I just wanted okay. to kind of reconcile, reconcile yeah. that information and just be clear about what the expectations would be. Yeah, we can do that as a finding in in the decision as to what was discussed here and what applicants said they would be trying to do. Work? Yeah, I support that. All right. Is there any further discussion? If not, I would entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to approve uh, the application for the demolition of a contributing historic structure as presented in the application materials um, and supporting materials provided at this hearing. Subject to uh, the following conditions is a pretty standard condition that in uh, the work, the applicant shall follow the erosion control practices outlined in section 3008D of the regulations. Um, and also uh, by agreement of the applicant that there will be a more extensive photo documentation of the structure prior to demolition and those photographs will be provided to the zoning administrator uh, to keep on file for the Historic Preservation Commission. Okay, motion by Ryan. Second. Second by Rob. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Opposed? Abstaining. The motion passes unanimously. Um, thank you, thank you very much. Thanks so uh, much. With that approval begins a 30-day window where people may appeal, but that seems unlikely because there's nobody here. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> some people I argue not it's, uh, some, people, some people argue it starts now, some people argue it starts when the written decision is issued. Mm -hmm. The 30 days? Yes. Okay. So there, there have been a couple of court cases where they say it's the verbal decision, mm -hmm. but sometimes that that's based on the matter going into executive session mm -hmm. and then somebody verbally explaining over the phone what that executive decision was. That's what I get for trying to be specific. And provide <laughs> yeah. so, um, so your permit will be granted at the closure of the appeal period, which will be detailed in the written decision. Yeah. Okay. We, what? I'm sorry. Well. You Hold can. on. No, okay. All right. <laughs> what, we, what we typically do, so there's a 45-day window, which this is not going to take 45 days, to issue the written decision. We'll get you the written decision as soon as we can. The way we usually do it downstairs is we issue the written decision and the permit to you on the same day, um, and that'll explain when your 30-day your appeal window ends. That'll be flagged on there. It's usually 30 days from the date of the written decision that it's signed. Okay. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Yana. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Um, moving on to agenda item seven, other business. Um, the only piece of other business I have to note is the next meeting is March 16th, 2020, at which you will be supported by your vice chair because I will, I will be absent for parental leave for the next couple of months. I look forward to rejoining you in May or June. Um, other other items or other business that others wish to raise? Oh, go ahead. Oh, I, I just had a question on um, are you, uh, if you have any additional applications and just kind of what you're seeing in the zoning department as far as kind of new yeah. applications coming in. <laughs> <laughs> You guys can have copies of these because it's a handy little bit. In case you don't look at the city manager's report, um, so we tallied this up the other day when we took a look and realized that the Development Review Board hadn't met in many, many months. Um, and so our planning director did a little review um, and we're really on track for the number of permits issued out of the planning department. So 2017, which is under the old zoning, there were 148 permits. In 2018, under the new zoning, there were 126. And last year, in 2019, there were 145. Mm -hmm. So that's total permits issued. So that's both Development Review Board, Design Review <coughs> Committee, and things that only get reviewed by um, the zoning administrator. So that those numbers aren't changing that much. Um, but with the 2018 regulation rewrite, a lot more permits were 
funneled towards administrative review only or design review and just administrative. Um, you know, under the old regulations, everything that went to the design review also had to come here. So those got wiped off your calendar. Um, they're just, I, unless we have a big uptick in large applications or like 2018, end of 2018, early 2019, a lot more subdivision applications, there just won't be as many design, development review board meetings um, because you won't have to deal with the small applications. Yeah, so for example, those of you who've been doing this or tracking this for a while know that we used to have a con consent agenda. We no longer have that. That was substantially to corroborate the decisions of the design review committee. Mm -hmm. um, anecdotally, I feel as though we also used to do a lot of variances. Mm -hmm. And because the zoning districts are analyzed to make sure that more, more of what we have is considered conforming, that makes it so that those types of additions, the porches, the the side yard things can be done, the sheds can be done administratively. So that I think has removed some of the burden from us. Mm -hmm. exactly. Has it increased the burden for you? Mm -hmm. um, the thing <laughs> is, I, I didn't come in until after the 2018 regulations went into effect. Um, things, you know, anecdotally, my understanding is things sped up back in 2016 mm -hmm. and things got busy and it just didn't slow down until this past fall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so things have kind of evened out a little bit and even for the, you know, even for the administrative permits, it hasn't, hasn't gotten crazy. Um, okay. So it's been, been good. All right. It's been good. But so it, the development review board may, may not actually meet, you know, twice a month for through the spring and summer. I don't know. We'll see what happens. We'll see which potential future big projects that keep popping up and not actually getting applications in actually happen. <laughs> yeah, I was I was actually surprised that that project came to the DRB. But I mean, I understand yeah. that the contributing structure component of it. Mm -hmm. um, but it made me wonder: is is there an option to, to approve something like that administratively, considering kind of the state of that structure? Well, so and, and how much of it is actually kind of apply, how much of it is actually relative to the standards mm -hmm. that are in the regulation? Um, so I don't know when if this would actually happen. There is a push from the Historic Preservation Commission to draft all new demolition provisions mm -hmm. that would um, have more of a staged review mm -hmm. um, so that even if the Development Review Board needed to make the decision on whether or not something still has historical significance, that might be all you looked at in this particular situation. Mm -hmm. And you would say, mm -hmm. This is, you make the final determination of it is no longer historically significant. We don't even need to look at the financial factors. Hmm. That doesn't come into play here with something this small that has already seen its integrity go down and it was not, you know, an intentional or negligent act. Mm -hmm. So it there's, was, just throw that out there. I don't know if that's going to make it through planning commission even or, or, or what. This is in early phases, but okay. there's, there's a lot of discussion about trying to figure out how to handle these demolition provisions mm -hmm. a little better. Sure, mm -hmm. they are complicated, and there are factors including the size of the, the size of the structure, the state of decay of the structure, intent mm -hmm. behind what led to the structure, all of which can be very hard to evaluate. So, please do keep us apprised of, of that. Uh, it is a difficult provision of the zoning to administer, mm -hmm. um, but the questions asked are important ones. So, please keep us in the loop. Will do. Thank you. Any other business? All right. Is there a motion to adjourn? A motion to adjourn. Motion by Rob. Second. I'll second that. Second by Claire. Any discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Motion passes unanimously. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much. <laughs>